doing a scheduling procedure question, different problems can arise depending on how many different workers you've got that you can assign to tasks. I'm going to do three different versions with this particular Gantt chart. I'm going to do four workers, three workers, and then two workers, and this will highlight the different problems. So starting with four workers, what I would do first of all is simply to write down worker one, worker two, worker three, worker four, so that I know where I'm going to be assigning tasks. You may then find it useful to draw horizontal lines so you can keep those each separate when you're assigning the tasks into them, like so. We then begin the procedure starting at time zero, and worker one can be assigned to task A. So I'll draw that in. Moving the time along so that we're carrying along until time five when something else happens, Worker 1 can be assigned to task B. Notice that task B is critical as it's part of our critical path. Each of these at the top are completely critical and must happen at the times that they have been allocated to in the Gantt chart in order to finish at the minimum time. Whereas task C can start at this point but it's not actually critical because it has this little bit of movement allowed up here. In order to get uh, activity C in, that would need to be assigned to worker 2. So we'll indicate that there. Now advancing the time until the next thing happens, which is all the way along until time 12, we've actually got three activities that can start at that time, and worker 1 can be assigned to task F, which can go in there. Worker 3 can be assigned to task D, which will fit in there and worker 4 can be assigned to task E, which will fit in there. Then advancing the time from 12 until the next activity is due to start, we go to 17, and of course G and H can both start at that time. So we've got worker 2 available, they can do task G, and worker 4 can do task H, which starts there and ends there. And they've got a little bit of free time in that gap there. Advancing the time on until the next one starts, we get to time 20, which can be given task I to worker 1, and advancing on again, and task K can be assigned to worker 1. And there we've got all of our activities assigned to our four workers. Everything was able to start at its earliest start time, and that's the four worker problem in this particular case. Next, I'm going to move on to the three worker problem. So for the three worker problem, we start off in exactly the same way, creating labels for workers one, two, and three, and putting in those horizontal lines to keep everything nice and organized. So starting at time zero, we can allocate activity A to worker 1. Moving to time 5, B is critical so we must assign that one first, and that one goes there, and activity C can be assigned to worker 2 as before, which fits in there. Advancing the time to 12, we've got F, D and E that could all start at that time. Now F is critical so that one must be allocated at that time, so that one we'll put for worker 1, there's F, and we see that D and E could both be started at time 12, however at time 12 we don't have two workers available, we've only got one. So we need to decide which one will be allocated to worker 3, and we must choose the one which is the most critical. Now what that means is E takes a total of four hours, so its latest start time to fit into this float area is here. Whereas D, taking a total of six hours, must have as its latest start time there. So E has to start before D has to start. We're talking about latest critical times. So E is the most critical one. So that's actually the activity we're going to assign to worker three. So that fits in there. So we now advance the time to when the next activity could start, which looking at our worker list, 
is at this point, at time 16. And at this point, the only activity that is not currently uh, scheduled is D. So D must then start at time 16. So we'll put that one in there. That's going to start for worker 3. And it must finish at time 22. So there's D allocated to worker 3. So we now advance the time from where we were at 16 to the next time an activity can start, which is at 17. And at this point, again, we've got two activities that could start at that time. If we look at the latest time that they could both start, it turns out to be the same for both of them. G could start here, and H could start here. However, if we allocate H first of all, we won't be able to fit G in afterwards, because that's not in the floating time allowed for G. So we can see that G is the most critical one. If we actually start G in the time it's got as its earliest starting time, we can then fit H in afterwards, which will take up that slot there. So actually G is the more critical of the two of them. So we would assign G to worker 2. So that one fits in there. We advance the time to 19, and now H can start. So that one will go until that time. Advance the time to 20. I can fit in. So that will go in there. And advance the time to 25. And that one will fit in there. So again, we've managed to allocate all of our activities to the three workers. Be a little bit careful when you're dealing with these sort of float areas and thinking about how you can move these activities in their sections and still fit them all in. So just take it carefully and you should be okay. Remember, it's just a case of fitting everything in where you can for the different workers. And lastly, the two worker problem. Now this one works a little bit differently. We start off as the same way, worker one and worker two. And the problem with two workers is that you've got a critical path which must be followed, and you've also got all these other tasks to assign. So we'll start off at time zero, and we'll give job A to worker 1, get to time 5, and we'll give task B to worker 1 as well, and we'll give task C to worker 2, as he's the only other person that can do it. Advancing the time to 12, of course there are three different tasks that can be started at that time. We choose the most critical one, so that's F, and that goes in, as per usual, for worker 1. We then come to time 17, which is when the next one can be assigned at this point. And of course, we've got D, E, G, and H, which could all be assigned um, to worker 2. Now, it may be that you've been given an activity network, in which case you may be able to see some reason as to why D has to come before E or E has to come before D, depending on the exact question. But um, seeing as E has the earliest finishing time uh, for the float, it would make sense that E would be the next one that you allocate. So we'll put that one in, which has a uh, finish time there for E. Worker 1 at time 20 gets activity I, it's the most critical one. Then at time uh, 21, well, now we've got the case that D is the most critical one, and that one would finish there for D. Time 25, we'll put activity K in. Then at time 27, we'll put G in, that's got to go in there. And at time 28, we can assign task H to worker 1, which fits in there. So the total finish time is greater than what we would have originally. Our critical path suggests that we can have a time finish at 28, and that just isn't possible when we've got two workers, because we do have to carry on a little bit longer with both G and H. That's just the way it is for those two workers. We still follow the same procedure, always assigning the most critical task at any one time. Of course, a lot of these problems um, for working out scheduling for workers and activities can often be done just by looking at the charts and just shuffling things around. 
the um, algorithm that's given is only one of several ways or several algorithms that you could use to solve this problem. As long as you get a working solution, and you can usually tell when it is or isn't, it should be absolutely fine. But that's it for our scheduling procedure and the last one of the decision maths algorithms. Oh! <laughs>